Hello everyone. It's really good to be here with you once again to move on to the fifth vision that Zechariah is given in the night. I hope you're enjoying the series. I want to start with a short story about my dad. My dad falls asleep in front of the TV. He does it all the time. When I was a little kid, I said to him, please dad, can we have a VCR? For those of you who are under 50, that stands for video cassette recorder. It used to be the way people recorded TV programs or played films that they had rented. I said, dad, please can we have one? All my mates have got one. My dad said, you know I always fall asleep in front of the TV. I can fall asleep in front of anything. There's no need for me to spend extra money on falling asleep. Human beings, not off. We do it all the time. And this passage starts with Zechariah nodding off. He has seen already four visions. They all take place while he is awake. And then he nods off. He goes to sleep. It's like his body has physically said, that's quite enough visions. And what I want to do is explore today why that is significant and why that is important. Human beings, Christians, have a tendency to fall asleep, but God doesn't. God is awake, alert, watching, and he, throughout his precious word, has called us to be awake, alert, and watching. And so when Zechariah falls asleep, he is woken because there is more for him to understand, more important things for him to absorb, more for him to get his arms around. And we're going to explore all of the different aspects of what that means in this vision right now. Just before we begin, there's two things I want to say. First of all, we're going to kind of look at each element of this beautiful vision through two lenses. One through the lens of how similar the goings on are to what happened with Jesus and his disciples. And then we're gonna look at it in a more personal way. What does it mean for us? Lastly, and this is important, I recommend that you get yourself a little download or uh, you can read it live if you have one, of an ESV Bible, or at least this little passage in an ESV Bible. The NIV is a great translation, but the translation of Zechariah 4 presents some difficulties, and I think we'll all do a lot better if we use an ESV this time. I hope that's not too onerous a task. And if you need me to print you off a copy of the passage, please let me know, and of course I'll be very happy to do that and get you set up with it straight away. So the passage begins with a really graphic description of the prophet Zechariah waking up. And here's how it starts. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. This is the point that dear Zechariah is emphasizing. He says, I didn't just nod off and, oh, there I am. He said, I was properly out. I was zonked and I was really coming round like a groggy individual, struggling perhaps to focus on what was going on, the importance of what this angel was sharing with him. If you look at the beginning of Zechariah, chapter 1 and verse 8, you will see a lovely couple of words that explain that this all takes place while Zechariah is wide awake, or at least it starts while he's wide awake. So this is very different from a dream in which God is speaking to him. This is an actual vision and an angelic visitation that's happening while he's awake. This opening verse or two reminds me very much of that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus has reached this climax, this uh, great and awful, and awesome apotheosis of all that he has come to do. He's facing his arrest and his impending death upon the cross. And the disciples have been at a party. They've been drinking and eating, singing, and they have had all kinds of different things happening and they fall asleep there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says, of course, famously, could you not wait and watch with me even one hour? We have that call be awake, be alive, be alert. And this is a call that is repeated to Christians 
over and over again. Jesus said to his disciples countless times, be alert, be awake, keep your lamps filled with oil, have spare oil so that you can recharge yourselves. Be focused absolutely relentlessly on what God is doing. Be passionate about pursuing it. I really love how St Paul emphasises this point. It's a very famous passage from his first letter to the church in Corinth. And he says these words, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Be focused. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Paul takes those very physical analogies to point out how every follower of Jesus must aspire to be. Very focused, very dedicated, and very, very awake and about the tasks we've been set. Having reminded us that we need to wake up and be focused on what the Lord is doing. The passage is really quite amusing. I found myself chuckling as I studied Zechariah 4. It's because when poor Zechariah is given this incredibly complicated vision, the angel says, well, there you go. Enjoy. I'm sure you've understood it. Let's move on. And Zechariah has to pause him and say, wait a minute, I didn't fully understand it. Let's just have a little look at Zechariah's words here in verse 4 he says and I said to the angel who talked with me what are these my lord then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me do you not know what these are how interesting there was an understanding on the angel's part an expectation that Zechariah would simply get what this complex picture was that he had been shown thank goodness for Zechariah's honesty he prompted the angel to give us an explanation, which means we can really start to clear up what this is all about and really mine it deeply for all the blessings the vision has for us. It is reminiscent of Doubting Thomas, as he is rather unfairly known, the wonderful disciple Thomas, who at the Last Supper sat listening to Jesus, as Jesus said some complicated, really, really difficult things. I would place a bet that virtually none of the disciples understood fully what Jesus was saying, but only one spoke up. Thomas said, right at the beginning of John 14, Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about. I do not understand. What do you mean? You say you're going somewhere. You say we know the way. I don't know where you're going. I don't know the way. What's happening? Of course, it prompts Jesus to say some of the most beautiful and precious words ever recorded in Scripture. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but that it is through me. It's all right to be honest with God. It's all right to express confusion, to ask for wisdom, to ask for understanding. And we have that beautiful New Testament promise that such things will be given to those who ask. And just so, this very complex vision is explained to Zechariah. What we're going to do now is dig deeply into that vision. We're gonna actually look at what Zechariah saw. Then we are gonna kind of put together and summarize how the angel explained it to him. It's surprisingly complicated, even with an explanation. So first of all, what did he see? He saw this really quite spectacular thing. He saw what is known in the Jewish religion as a menorah. That is a seven-branched candlestick. And he saw a great big one. It was huge. And attached to the top of it was a golden bowl full of oil. And we find later in the vision explanation that there are pipes or spouts coming out the side so the oil can be poured and delivered. Now, the menorah has seven branches, and each branch has either a candle or an oil lamp on it. And this particular menorah, this great big one that Zechariah could see, had seven lamps. 
on it, oil lamps, and each one of those seven lamps had seven individual spouts with a wick sticking out of it burning. Those lamps were actually rather common in ancient times, in the same way that you might go to Tesco's to buy a 30 watt bulb or a 60 watt bulb. You could buy an oil lamp with two wicks, three wicks, five wicks, seven wicks, it was great. So what you've in fact got is a spectacular image surrounded by olive trees. You have this image of no less than 49 lights shining there before Zechariah. So the overall message is one about vision. God is watching. That's the kind of the grand statement of this particular vision. God is watching and God is overseeing something. He is guaranteeing something. Zerubbabel has started to build the temple and he's going to finish building it. In just the same way that he's laid foundations, there will be a point where he places on the capstone or the top stone, as the ESV puts it, translating the Hebrew very literally. Zechariah will put the top, the last stone, in place. He will finish what he has started all completely in God's strength, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What a beautiful sentence of scripture that is. So the lamps represent the all-seeing eyes of God. They are burning persistently, perpetually. They see, they look, and there are seven branches of the candlestick, seven being a number, and there are seven wicks in each lamp. So it's kind of perfection times perfection to describe God's ability to see what's going on. God sees, knows, and understands everything, and he is in charge of what's going on. Very reassuring. Now, just at the end, the vision gets really weird because Zerubbabel, the chap who came with Joshua, the high priest, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the guy who is rebuilding the temple has done it. We have this promise from God that the temple that was started to be rebuilt will be fully and completely rebuilt by Zerubbabel. But then just at the end, we see him with a plumb line in his hand. Isn't that strange? A plumb line is used at the very beginning of a building project. It's used to get an exact vertical line. And the builder uses the plumb line, carefully looking along it and making measurements and marks to plan and to plot the entire building project. What's happening here? Why is it mentioned at the very end? Well, this is one suggestion as to what it might mean. Perhaps the building of the temple is not the end of the project at all. Perhaps it is the very beginning of something God himself is going to do. Yes, the plumb line is in the hand of Zerubbabel, this governor who is rebuilding the city, but the eyes of God are looking down upon it and the eyes of God are seeing that the whole building project that Zerubbabel has undertaken is just the start. When it is completed, God will continue to build and build and build something that isn't just bricks and stones, but something spiritual, his kingdom. And that building will eventually bring forth Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, and it will bring forth the salvation of the entire world. We're seeing a vision not just of a man called Zerubbabel two and a half thousand years ago building a temple and completing it while God watches. We are seeing the whole temple being nothing more than the first block in the mighty building of faith and salvation that God himself is building. The conclusion of this vision is a really very, very lovely thing. Let me just read it for you so that we can appreciate it again together. I'm starting at verse 11. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? I'd forgotten all about them. Thanks for reminding me, Zechariah. And a second time, 
I asked, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the oil is poured out? He said to me once again, do you not know what these are? What an incredible moment. Can you feel the tension there? This time the angel is so shocked that Zechariah hasn't understood that he doesn't even answer him. Zechariah says, hey, what are these two trees standing by the bowl with the spouts filled with oil, standing by this thing that is so patently and obviously symbolic of God's bountiful provision and blessing, the anointing oil being poured out what are these trees? What are they? The angel doesn't even answer. I imagine perhaps if an angel can have a dropped jaw, shocked expression, the angel might have that. So Zechariah asks the question again, and he thinks maybe I wasn't precise enough. And he goes, what about these? Literally by the spouts. He's more descriptive. He's more specific. Tell me. The angel says, do you not know? And then of course, the angel answers him. Listen in amazement to verse 14. He said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. What might that mean? Well, we've had a whole chapter of Zechariah all about Joshua, the high priest. This chapter has focused a lot on Zerubbabel, the governor who is taking charge of the rebuilding project. But what of the two prophets that God sent to pour his blessings into the lives of God's people and to steer them and to bless them? Haggai and Zechariah himself. Two trees, two olive trees of blessing standing in God's presence at his right and at his left as a conduit to pour his blessings into the world. Poor Zechariah prompted that incredulity from the angel because he did not recognize himself. He could see a vision of his own precious and important place in God's plan and he didn't know it. He didn't understand just how precious and important to God he was and indeed is. How like the disciples of Jesus that is. They didn't fully get who Jesus was, how important what they were being called to do was, what their role was going to be, the blessings God was going to pour into their lives. Just so for us, do we really fully grasp that we stand in the presence of the almighty and ever-living God? Do we really fully understand that his Holy Spirit makes his dwelling place within each person who confesses Jesus as Lord and Saviour and that God's goodness is poured into the world through all who have given their lives to Christ. This is a salutary and a lovely warning. We can all fall asleep and nod off. My dad liked to fall asleep, I think he still does. I know I certainly do. The disciples nodded off constantly. Zechariah nodded off. He didn't understand fully what was going on. He didn't even recognize himself when he saw himself in the vision. But none of those things alter the great and beautiful truth that God has chosen to use us. And God has a wonderful plan of love and salvation that we are bound into. I pray that these few reflections will be a real blessing for you over the week. Bless you. See you soon.